Hey everybody, welcome back to C-Squared. In our last segment, we learned the story of Manny, who was letting us know about how he ended up in the foster care system. And you were actually telling me how the home that you were placed in with your aunt and her boyfriend actually turned it out turned out being worse than the initial home with your, obviously with your biological parents that you were taken out of. So after that experience, were you placed in a different home or what happened after that? Yes, yeah, so I, that's when I went into living in foster homes at the age of 11, maybe going on 12. Foster homes, so you lived in several homes. So I lived in about four different foster homes and five group homes, and I was also hospitalized twice in the mental institution. Wow, so it was like what, like 11 different places that you I guess at one point considered home. Correct, from the age of like 11, 11 and a half to 18. So that can be a little traumatic. I mean, clearly the foster care system is intended to help you know children and, and kind of stabilize them emotionally and clearly physically so they can have like a, a somewhere to call home. So how do you feel, of, how was the foster care experience for you? Do you think it was a, a good experience or why don't you let us know? You know, just experiencing child abuse and neglect in general was hard, but I think I had some of the greatest times in my life in the foster care system and group homes. I met a lot of good people and built a lot of great relationships. If I can go back and live the same life that I did, I would, because I feel like being in the foster care system helped shape me into the man that I am today, and it's making me become more of a man in general. And I have no regrets about my life and I, I feel like I lived, despite all the struggles and turmoil, I lived a very blessed life. And that's amazing actually and that's really good. Now we're going to go ahead and introduce our second guest of the day. Just like Manny, our second guest was also placed in foster care but she was placed at the foster at the age of 15. Her name is Nikki Taylor and Nikki I'd like to welcome you to Sea Squared, hon. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm good, good. And first of all, let me just start off by saying that you are beautiful, okay? You. Now, Nikki identifies as a transgender woman. So I think that's very important to, to mention, first of all, because I think that um, Manny never mentioned him coming out necessarily to any of his foster families, but you've been identifying as transgender since a very young, young age, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. At what age did you realize that you were transgender? Well... I think I've always known that I was in, I've always felt like I was been, I've always been in the wrong body. Um, from the age of being in kindergarten, I remember being, just playing house with my classmates and we, I'd always be wanting to play the daughter. And I've never just felt comfortable doing boy things, wearing boy clothes, and it's just always been that way. But I think I, it finally clicked to me when I got into freshman year in high school that I was obviously not in the right body and I wasn't living the correct life through my eyes. Okay, so for example, you started being in the foster care program at the age of 15 as opposed to Manny at six. Mm -hmm. Can you let us know how that happened? Um, so my story is kind of similar to Manny's when it comes to being taken away from my biological parents. I ended up going to live with my grandparents and my grandfather was an old southerner. He's from North Carolina. He's from the time where I was with him, he was 60 years old, so he was already an old timer. Right. Used to old ways, used to old habits, traditional things. And um, so living there was strange already because he wanted me to play football, basketball, do boy things because all my uncles did it, but I never understood why it seemed fun. It didn't seem the slightest bit fun to me. <laughs> I wanted to be jumping around and do so cheerleading. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to dance and be happy, and he just never understood it, and he always questioned it. And then so uh, the more and more I became one with myself and accepting of myself, mm -hmm. um, the more and more I started to show it at home. And he didn't like that at all because I became real com comfortable and I'd walk around feeling happy just being who I was. Right. And that was wrong through his eyes because through his eyes, I'm supposed to be this manly buff man who's catching footballs. I'm the quarterback, but that's not the case at all. I'm a dancer. Like I love arts and it just wasn't okay with him because all of his sons were sports athletes, great men, but I just wasn't. And so I don't think he ever understood it and he didn't really accept who I was because I was so different. So with that said, with you being so different, uh, when you were placed into a foster home, what was the reaction of a foster family having someone that identified as transgender in their home? Um, confusion. Yeah. A lot of confusion. Because, like, when I'm, of course, when you go into a foster home, they give them all your legal doc documents, your birth certificate. They obviously tell you, tell them 
your legal name, which mine is Trenton Almquest. Um, Trent and I and Elm Quest, and they would look at that and be like, okay, so what's... This doesn't correlate, yeah. right? Yeah, and then also seeing on my birth certificate, born male, yet they're looking at a female, and then just having to explain it to all the foster siblings that I moved into with, they just weren't used to it, and so when I first moved into one, it was a, it was a Spanish-speaking home. The foster parents didn't speak English. I don't know why they put me there, but they did, and my foster um, siblings they just kind of like looked at me like I was some new creature that they'd never seen before. Right. One, I had a, there was a foster brother, I forgot what his name was, but he, they placed me in a room with him because by law, since I am born a male, I have to be roomed with a male. Right. And so he walked in the room and I was sitting there and he was like, you're in the wrong room. And I was like, that's an awkward conversation I have to start now to explain to this guy why I'm in his room and why I'm not sleeping with the foster sister. And so it was just always so awkward. And so it didn't work out there because he's not used to it and he didn't understand it. So he automatically shut it off and he wouldn't sleep in the room because he felt uncomfortable. He thought I was going to hit on him. He thought I was going to climb in the bed with him. He wasn't Just cute, a lot of so stereotypes. He, he got that from nowhere. <laughs> but, but he yeah. was going based off of stereotypes. Yeah. So my question to you is, did you live in multiple homes just like Manny? Yes. Um, How many homes did you live in? From the time of 15 to 18, I think I had about eight placements. Um, four of them are foster homes, two of them are group, no, three of them are group homes. And then also there was um, an adoptive family that I almost moved into. And then just like Manny, I also was placed in um, behavioral medical centers for um, psychiatric problems. I attempted suicide a couple times because I wasn't happy with oh, how wow. I was going through life and how things weren't happening the way I thought life should be. Right. And I felt alone, I didn't have anybody. And so I'd been in and out of psychiatric wards multiple times, they put me on medication. And so due to, be, due to being put on medication, they had to put me in higher level group homes to make mm -hmm. sure I was being watched over, to make sure I didn't attempt anything again. And so during my senior year in high school, I think I moved four times. So that, that's actually a very, very drastic experience and not many people understand that suicide is a very common denominator for a lot of people in foster care and let alone you on top of that have a lot of societal rejection due to the misunderstanding of what being transgender is. So is it safe to say that for you the foster care system was not a good experience? Um, yes and no because um, I think it made me stronger mm -hmm. and it made me way more resilient than I would have been if I stayed with my grandfather because right. when I was with my grandfather I just stayed reserved. I didn't really fight for what I believed in. I didn't speak speak up for myself when I entered foster care and the first time I felt prejudice and I felt being felt like I was being bullied. I was like, no, I'm being forced to live here. You're going to respect me. Right. And so I got into a lot of fights at first because um, it was a I just defense wasn't gonna, mechanism. Yeah, it was an immediate defense mechanism. Obviously, I'm not going to let you talk about me right in front of me without saying something back. And a lot of foster youth, they're just as quick to fight back. So if you say something to them, they're quick to say something back to you, and it can escalate just like a flip of a coin. You're fighting all of a sudden, and there's weave being thrown, boys <laughs> being punched. You said weave being thrown. Uh, you're, you're very humorous about it, and clearly it's, it's, a, it's a part of your life that you've overcome, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're able to look at that experience and, and see it as a learning lesson. Yeah. And I think that's very important because a lot of people, unfortunately, grasp, out, grasp onto these negative experiences and hold them as um, maybe as a flag to wave and always adopt a victim role. Mm -hmm. And I see you here sitting confident, beautiful, and just proud to share your story, and I think that's amazing. So my question to you is, um, having lived this, uh, are you pro foster care system now? I mean, do you what 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 kind of uh, I guess advice you would give to maybe better the system or? I think the foster care system is is amazing because obviously, where else where the, will these youth go? We don't want them staying with abusive families. We don't want them continuously having to be beaten every day just for being who they are. Right. I think the best advice to give a youth that's going through stuff like this is. Just stick through it, stay strong, because everything that happened to me made me the stronger person I am today. Correct. Like, I wouldn't be this confident if I hadn't gotten in so many fights. I wouldn't be this strong if I hadn't attempted to kill myself, because when I attempted, then I finally valued, and I, and I made it through, I valued the life that I had. And um, now I work for as a peer mentor for a program for foster youth, and I see the awesome. inspiration that I give to them because of how I fought through all the struggle that I went through. I went through a lot, and instead of using that as, um, 
as a reason to just be isolated and just to let that be the reason I'll be weak. No, I wasn't gonna let that. I let it be the reason I grew strong. I let it be the reason that I am the person I am today. Like, I fought so hard to be who I am today. I lost my entire family just to be who I am today. Who you truly are. And I'm, yes, I'm sad that I lost that family, but in the end, I'm still going to build my new family. Yes, right. they said, they say um, blood is thicker than water, but sometimes that's not true. Because obviously in my case, it wasn't thicker it's than water. It's very circumstantial, you're very right. And I believe you also have something to do in the foster care system as well, no? I do work for child welfare. Yes, yes. and what is it that motivated you to work in child welfare? It just happened to fall in my lap. Uh, at 18, I didn't want nothing to do with the foster care system. I somehow got this job application, applied for it, and now I'm working with foster kids. So would you say it's meant to be? I mean, think about it. You have this life experience, and now you get to work with these children. But what is it exactly that you do? Though? I mentor foster kids. Okay. And it, it was meant, or it is meant, it's meant to be, and I enjoy what I do, and I love being there for these kids. Awesome. Would you say it's meant to be for you? Yeah, I definitely feel like it was meant to be. I, I feel like I feel so naturally and it just comes so um, genuine while I'm helping teach these kids life skills that they usually use, learn from their parents and just showing them how, they, how I use it in my own life and how it has helped me just move forward in my life. And I totally agree. I think also the benefit is that you create more responsiveness from the children because not only are you mentors, but you also are now examples for them to follow on. Okay, so when we come back, we'll talk more to Manny and Nikki about where they're at now in life. But before that, make sure that you check out this section of Boots on the Ground because they're asking questions that we talk about here on the film. All right, see you guys in a bit. Hey everyone, I'm Steve Mai from C Square. We're doing a segment called Boots on the Ground. I'm right here in West Hollywood, California. So now we're gonna go see and see who we can find and ask some questions. So come on. You know Actually, I have a number of friends who are adopted and gay, and um, I feel like their struggle is just the same as anyone else's, but in general, there's not enough focus on LGBTQ growing up and coming into society. It's like you grow up and then you're just kind of thrown into you know, West Hollywood and expected to be a go-go dancer. Um, and that's not everyone's identity. First of all, I think that we need a, a kind of a broader understanding of what it means to identify yourself as a person. And then I also think that we need some kind of a maybe mentorship program, which I just mentioned, or um, maybe there needs to be some kind of like governmental policy to kind of recognize that there's at-risk individuals who are at like, greater risk of suicide and drug use who um, might have benefit from uh, certain programs, different sociological programs, whether it's, you know, counseling or um, just like youth groups that could really recognize these people. There aren't enough of them. And if there are, I don't know about them. Whoever could we ever could we be? I can never be nothing but authentically me. If you're looking for a place to have crucial conversation, no longer have to fear, because you can have them here, here, here. 